Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Ali Bujan of Channon. I'm an academic based in the business school here at King's and I will be hosting your seminar today. Um, so a bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, I'm going to be doing the introductions and then we'll expect to be hearing from our panel of three for roughly about 40 minutes today. And then we'll leave the last section for any questions that you might have as the audience. So please feel free to put forward any questions um, and our student panelists will be fielding those. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So um, welcome to the last in what has been a really successful and enjoyable connection series. Um, a series we've been running for the King's Business School like a community this, this term. Um, we've had a variety of speakers um, and while I may be biased, I think we're probably finishing on a bit of a high today with our speakers. So I'll introduce you to those who will be joining us today. Um, on the panel, we have Kath Bishop, uh, whose book, The Long Win, actually prompted this talk. Um, so a bit about Kath. Dr. Kath Bishop is an Olympian, um, a former diplomat and a business coach. Um, she's competed in rowing at three Olympic Games, um, one championship gold and Olympic silver. As a diplomat uh, for the British Foreign Office for 12 years, Kath specialised in policy and negotiation on conflict issues. Um, and she now works as a business consultant and leadership coach. And she's an author and teaches on executive education programmes at Judge Business School at Cambridge. I'd also like to introduce to you Ollie Humphreys. Um, Ollie is a business leader who brings with him a wealth of experience and war stories from his time across a number of sectors, including leisure, retail, gambling, and hospitality. Um, over the last 20 years, Ollie's worked for a number of big names in industry, from TravelX to WH Smiths, KFC, and William Hill. But most latterly, he was managing director at Frankie and Benny's. And so Ollie's going to be talking to us today about his industry experience, and I, for one, am looking forward to that. Last but not least, let me introduce you to Navya Sethi, our student panelist today. Um, Navya is on our BSc Business Management, and she's from India. Um, Navya says that she believes in the power of student voice to make a positive difference, and that's why she's currently serving as a student rep for her class and as a KBS 20 panel board member. Um, she loves solving challenges and engaging with the community and pushing herself outside of her comfort zone. And we're keeping her busy at King's. She's a consultant for the 180 Degrees Consulting Group. She's a performance analyst for the King's Business Club. And she is an events associate for the KCL Economics and Finance Society. Um, and get some sleep sometimes, I hope, as well. So without further ado, let's get started. I mentioned it was Kath's new book, The Long Win, that really inspired this talk. So that's probably a great place to start. Kath, the premise of your book and the main argument is to do with the way that we define success. And you argue there are better ways to succeed in life and business than winning at all costs, to use the phrase that you use. Can you tell us a bit about how the idea for the book came about? Yeah, absolutely. Great to be here. Thanks, Ali. Good to be with you all. Um, I think... There's one question that's always fascinated me throughout um, throughout my life, whether it's as an athlete or as a diplomat or in the work I do now with, with business organisations. And, and that was really just to think, you know, what, what, what do I need to do to be successful? What, what does success look like? What are the key criteria? And I think I started off thinking, uh, you know, I, I kind of knew the answers to that. And I realised in, in all of those careers that really it, it's something that I probably hadn't thought about. I realised there was a much broader world of performance in sport than just training hard, for sure. And I realised sort of in diplomacy, it's not kind of how smart you are and how much you know your, your negotiating briefings and um, the, the books and the technical background to, to that. And when you step into a negotiating room, it then becomes about how you connect with other people, what's happening in that room, the, the human side, if you like, the mindsets, the way people are thinking, the beliefs they bring with them, the way they behave. And, um, you know, just as the same in, in, in sport, the performance is not just about how fit and strong you are. It, it's really about how much you can optimize all of all of what you can possibly bring to a race and the way you think and behave and connect with those in the crews and in the, the wider support team around you. And of course, I found the same going into business as well. And yet in all of these worlds, we still seem to be defining success in quite a narrow way. I mean, it often starts at school and then it kind of carries on beyond that. I'd actually be interested before we sort of go into more detail. I'd, I'd love to hear from sort of all of those who, who joined us today. When I talk about the word success, when we mention that, what is it that comes into your head as what you associate with success? 
So we'd love you to just add on the chat as a bit of a warm up for our topic. Um, what are the things that you associate with what success looks like? So, you know, pop it in the chat because then you'll kind of get us get us underway with what, what you're bringing to to the topic. Um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of that that we will kind of also kind of pick up on the way. So, yeah, some great themes coming in. Amazing. And really broad as well. Self-fulfillment, pride, interesting competition. That's a topic that, that I love to um, stretch and think about in lots of different ways. Wealth, achieving the desired result, not always winning, but it's always nice. So we all have an instant connection. We all start having something that we associate. Please carry on putting them in the chat when you've just had a thought about what is it that pops into your head. And I think I, I sort of have observed quite a narrow view often of what winning looks like. So we, we typically define it at, at school as being around uh, the grades we get. Perhaps that carries on at university, who knows? Um, how you feel you're defining it, you know, in, in the King's context. Um, and then, okay, we get into sport, everybody's counting medals. We get into the workplace, what are we counting? Profit margins, sales numbers, and so on. And what, what I found is that actually the obsession with medals in sport doesn't actually help you to win them. And similarly in business, a sort of narrow focus on narrow, uh, on, on quite short term metrics can really get in the way of developing what's required to be successful in as much more sustainable long-term way. Brilliant, thank you, Kath. Um, Ollie, can I bring you in just to sort of as a starter for 10, how does this resonate with what you've seen your, as your, in your time as a leader? Yeah, hello everyone, um, delighted to be here as well. I think from first time I started chatting with, with Ali and with Kath, so many things that resonate here. Um, I've grown up for 20 years in different PLC businesses um, and uh, I've definitely started to see a bit of a shift over that time but it still is absolutely a desire to win uh, a win at all costs a dog eat dog world and, and these kind of phrases that you hear that are incredibly narrow um, and actually those those success factors in business typically are pound notes um, and profit that businesses are, are making um, and, and unfortunately, certainly in a PLC world, um, but also in private equity, this can be very short termism. Um, and therefore, we're not always thinking about the people, the collaboration pieces that, that were just mentioned by Kath. Um, we're often thinking about what are short term goals uh, and can we win from a financial standpoint? And therefore, often not making what I'd call good business long term decisions for, for the people and the success of, of the brand. Thank you. And Kath, in your book, you talk about different pillars um, of success, don't you? The three C's, I think, what you recall. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the three C's? Yeah, so uh, I guess I, I kind of looked at really what, what's going wrong, first of all, because, you know, as, as Ali's saying, there's, uh, as, as, well, as we've all been saying, there's a desire for us to be successful. And yet, if we kind of measure it very narrowly, we, we stop ourselves from exploring our potential in a broader way and in a slightly longer term way. And so I look at how it's been holding us back in education, in business, in politics and sports, and then start to define how could we reframe this? And the three C's offer us kind of themes, if you like, for exploring and broadening what success means that will enable us to be more successful. So we're not talking about lowering standards. We're not talking about we don't want our companies to do well, but we're talking about making sure that, yeah, we're not doing things in the short term that harm us in the long term, or that we're not chasing goals that actually kind of hold us back. Because quite a lot of times I'll be, you know, invited into companies who will say, you know, we want to raise performance um, because we can see there's also a lack of engagement in staff surveys, there are all sorts of issues. And yet we, we want to win, we want to be winners. And there isn't this disconnect between the two isn't always seen that actually it doesn't bring any meaning to people's daily lives, their work lives, if they're just the company's trying to be number one, you know, in, in order to do what? And so I'm always looking to clarify the first C of the three C's is is clarity clarify what really matters and that needs to go beyond any single metric what's the meaning of that metric what's the impact that metric will allow you to do if you are number one in your sector or your industry 
then what's the responsibility that comes with that in order to move that sector on or to to improve the lives of the communities, the customers, the environment, you know, whatever you're engaging with through your through your company. So it's about clarifying broader success criteria that can't be a single number that have to have some kind of meaning, some kind of purpose over a slightly broader perspective. I mean, it's actually also about making day-to-day uh, a sense of success on a day-to-day basis when we're not achieving any metrics, but how we turn up, how we lead, how we engage with the team is important. So we're not just looking ahead. We're almost stretching away from the deadlines of the next quarter, you know, both to you know, actually, what do I need to do, to do today in order to be a good colleague or a good leader? And what do I need to do in the longer term? So clarifying broader success criteria. The second C is a constant learning mindset where we actually recognize and uh, reward or, or uh, kind of really value learning, improvement, innovation, trying new things, because in itself, that is the fuel of success in the future. But if we're afraid of making mistakes, if we're just doing, 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 doing the same we've already in the way we've already done things, then at some point that will run out. We can't just do the same things anymore. So we need this constant learning mindset. And that in itself is a key criteria of success in within the long win uh, thinking. And the final C is connections. We can none of us succeed alone. And let's put connections therefore first in what we're doing. Let's invest in relationships. When we're reviewing how well our week has gone, let's not just think it's a matter of totting up the tasks we've delivered or the action points we've carried out. Let's actually consider who have we supported? Who have we built connections with? Who have we influenced? Um, you know, what relationships have we deepened? And, and where might we want to invest further in, in our connections in the next week? So we're changing, if you like, some of those criteria with which we review success. But also criteria that are very much within our control to shift, to change, to clarify success more on our own terms, to make sure that we are constantly learning and moving on everything we do. And, and we have a choice with everyone we engage with in every meeting, every conversation, how we bring ourselves to that and what we bring from others out of those interactions. Super. Can I, can I, can I, can I jump in on a couple of, of pieces on, on all three C's? I think um, certainly for the audience, um, as uh, you know, potential business leaders in the future, you've, you've got something that's going to really sit on your shoulders here because I don't think many businesses historically really did think about what was their purpose. And I think the ones that really did are the ones that have stayed the test of time and, and, and really do shine through. Um, I did some work about six years ago with all the franchisees for KFC in the UK and Ireland. And we asked all 36, mostly millionaires, um, to really think about um, what was their purpose. And it couldn't be about profit and it couldn't be about turnover. Um, and that took probably a full day of thinking time for some of these quite accomplished entrepreneurs to really think about why did they exist um, and that span us off into a second piece of work where we talked about just not their business, but them personally. Um, and I'd encourage any of you to think about this personally. Um, I do it at least once a year where I revisit my personal brand and I check that everything I'm doing is in keeping with my brand. Or if it's not, if I want to change what my brand stands for slightly and the reasons why. And that could really come from really this, the second part, part of what... Um, Kath's been talking to us about, which is constant learning. So, you know, I'd make sure that I'm constantly challenging myself um, to, to make sure I'm staying up to date with trends, what's going on in the world, what I'm hearing, what people want, um, and certainly going back to purpose. I'd say in the last two years, I've had more questions about social responsibility and what I'm doing for the environment than I'd had in the previous 18. So you'll start to see things that are really starting to come up on the agenda. And, and hopefully that's really resonates with some of you listening uh, to this today. Um, but then also just challenging yourself on that constant learning. Um, you know, I like to think that I'm here now is helping me to learn because I'm listening to Kath and Ali uh, and I'll hopefully learn from some of the questions that you guys ask us later on and make me think about what I'm going to do at the next business that, that I turn up to. Uh, and then on, on collaboration, I think, you know, I'm fortunate that actually, you know, I didn't have all the grades. I wasn't winning at school. Um, but actually, one of the things that I've done well is, is, is been able to connect with people. And whether that be through humility, whether that be through opening up and showing a bit of vulnerability, 
whether that be giving a bit of trust before you receive it. Um, th these things really do help you get on from a business standpoint. Um, and many still in business, unfortunately, see those as weaknesses um, and can perceive that to be a threat and therefore will go against working as part of a team to achieve the goals that you're after um, and, and therefore go head to head in competition when actually you work for the same business. Um, and I was reminded of something this morning that, that actually made me chuckle. So I, I recently left the restaurant group. Um, the restaurant group's the, the biggest listed uh, food business in the UK um, and runs number one and number three of the, the restaurant chains in the UK, in Wagamama and Frankie and Benny's, but also has Chiquitos as part of the group. And when I joined, there was a competition of who could get more guests through the door. Um, and Chiquitos were offering 51% off main meals to beat Frankie and Benny's 50% off main meals. Now, all that they were achieving there in most of these locations were you had the same two restaurants owned by the same company on the same retail or leisure park. So you were discounting the same guest when you actually didn't need to discount at all. Um, and it was a competition for stats and numbers, but was actually depleting not only your profits, but also the brand because everyone thought that actually they wanted more and more discount each time that they came to visit. So uh, in the long run, was detrimental to the business. And probably detrimental to the morale as well when you're competing against each other as, you know, within the same organization. For, for, for general managers, um, so running the, these individual brands, you know, when I joined the business, the first thing I did was I went out for uh, 12 days and went to 51 restaurants um, and, and ate the same meal th everywhere, you know, three course meal. And one of the consistent themes I heard was, I can't believe we're competing against our friends next door. And on a very local level, um, these people shared staff, they shared food, they shared different things to, to help out in the local community. But at a corporate level, um, we were killing them really by, by making some very poor decisions, not based on, on what was seen on, on the high street. Thank you, Ollie. And I'm interested because um, obviously the three C sounds like a really brilliant mindset to have. Um, but thinking about your respective context where you both come from, if you were to turn around and say, uh, as you know, an Olympian, for example, it's not all about the winning, or to your boss, Ollie, it's not about the bottom line. How do you think that would be received? And how can we package that kind of message in a way that, that then will be well received? So, I mean, the irony is it, it doesn't help you to win medals to think about winning medals. Um, and, and yet we seem to be quite slow at realising that. And we just get sort of sucked, at, you know, sucked ahead to look at what's coming and to look at the outcomes if you like so we have this outcome focus that is really strong in organizations in sport in schools so we get used to it and we start talking about it all the time and then it becomes more important and what we do in the process is we then take our eye off what we're actually doing now which is the process of that will take us towards any of those outcomes and so we stop optimizing that process because we're so busy looking ahead to the outcomes that we want um, and then that means we're going to minimize our chances or we're going to certainly not optimize the chances of getting the best results. Sports psychology has has uh, over the last sort of 20 years made a big shift in this area where it separates out the concepts of performance and results. Results are something we're not in control of because they depend on external factors. So if you're an Olympic athlete, it's going to determine on how fast the rest of the world go. Uh, might also be determined on you know, whether you hit the crossbar in football or referees or umpires or others or luck. Um, so, you know, putting all everything into that is really risky. What you can do, however, though, is put everything into delivering your best performance and exploring that and pushing that so that there's no ceiling on it. It's not defined by how fast somebody else went necessarily. Actually, it's about what's possible for you. So you go beyond simply trying to beat the person next to you and expand beyond, which is why I think this approach could actually achieve much higher performance. And so, again, if we have that focus on performance, we optimize the results, but we also acknowledge that we can't control them. We're very, we get very stressed if, we, if we're kind of results um, uh, dependent all the time. We can get on a real roller coaster of thinking everything's great if we win and everything's awful if we lose. We might actually have the 
the same performance that in one scenario will help us to win because of what's happened with others involved in that. And in another scenario, we lose. I mean, in the year of 2020, a lot of businesses are feeling that they have failed because they will not hit the targets that they projected in January. But that's kind of, is that really failure? Because that's way beyond their control. But you will feel that failure much more if as an organization, that's all you focused on achieving. If you didn't ever kind of have success defined in terms of broader criteria of, you know, the innovation that be going on, the relationship building, the team working, if we didn't have those sort of performance measures and recognition of focus on those, then some companies are really struggling with morale. They're also struggling to adapt, if you like, because they don't really understand why they're doing things. They're just about hitting the numbers. So then if the numbers aren't there, uh, what do we do? Because, oh my goodness, we can't do what we were doing anymore. Whereas if you actually understand the meaning behind the numbers, you're able to start thinking, well, how else can we reach customers who still have a need for this? Or maybe the need has shifted and therefore we need to shift what we do. So again, you know, the need to have meaning behind medals or numbers in organizations is critical to enabling the kind of behaviors and ways of thinking that will help us to deal with uncertainty that is there for all of us, whether you were planning to win an Olympic medal in Tokyo or planning to get record profits this year. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you're spot on. And actually, as you're talking, I can start thinking of many business leaders I've spoken to even in the last couple of weeks. Um, and you think about those who've been able to pivot their business and do something very different and serve a different market versus those who've dug their heels in and are a little bit, dare I say, woe is me. Um, I'm not going to hit my numbers this year and, and 2020 is a disaster. Um, but if, if, if I go back to the original question, um, you know, those questions in a PLC boardroom, when I turn up to a board um, and say, I'm going to plan to make less profit this year than I did last, aren't greeted with smiles. Um, and I think we'd you know, be foolish to think that they are. However, what I do think is if you can articulate the, the right storyline to go with it and can project a plan over 12 12 months, three years, five years, that says, this is why I'm taking the action I am. Um, actually, I think we would have seen many businesses that we're losing currently from the high street saved if they had taken mm. some of those, those uh, thought processes. And to give a, a real example, when I inherited Frankie and Benny's, um, it had been a loss, uh, you know, it, it had downturn every year in terms of turnover growth for the prior five years. Um, and to get it back into growth, we had to make some quite drastic decisions. Um, and to get that top line turnover, the only way really was to go back was to how were we going to talk to our customers? Um, and, and the problem that they had at the time was our food quality wasn't great and they didn't really know what we stood for anymore. So, you know, an Italian American brand that had lost its heritage really by trying to chase every single trend that had gone on in the marketplace for a short time. So being able to say I was going to cut the menu by nearly 50%, I was going to invest in the cost of a steak and invest in the cost of spaghetti bolognese, but charge the same price to the guest. This, you know, that's not news that most businesses want to hear, but actually if you want the customer to come and then come back again um, and tell their friends they've had a great experience, then that's a pill that you have to swallow at that point in order to get yourself there. You also then get your arm twisted um, when you're in, you know, boardrooms like that, that says, well, hold on a minute. You know, we've got a group to balance here. What else could you do? And can you innovate? So can you go and think about something else? And so, you know, one of the things we did at Frankie and Benny's was we launched three brand new online brands that were made up from scratch that no one had ever heard of before and cooked them out of our Frankie and Benny's kitchens and served them to guests. Now that made me 17 million pounds in a full year. Now that's 70 million that I could reinvest or the part of the profit part of that into the rest of, of the business. So that there are ways, and I do think, you know, having the right team around you, watching what other people do, not just in your own marketplace, but, but certainly abroad as well to say, how could we pivot our business to get the best returns and get back to our core so that we have got a purpose? Um, I, I think that's the conversation you can have with your board. And, you know, mine was all signed off. So, you know, the, the board were accepting that I predicted us to have further decline in order to grow again in the future. 
It's a really interesting piece there, isn't there, about the story you tell of success, if you like. What what criteria are you determining? And, and what I want us to do is to be defining it, you know, in our own terms, if you like, it by having that fuller picture of what's happening than a single number, than just the profit margins and just the, the shareholder returns that you're going to get. And I mean, we have an increase now in the, you know, ESG reporting that's that's pressurizing companies. To, 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 to start to tell this different story of what's your environmental footprint, what's the impact that you are having on the communities, what social value do you bring? So we're beginning to do this. Um, and I think the, the opportunity is to really grab that and shape that and that to be part of who you are rather than to sort of resist it and think, well, I'll do it to the minimum. What, what do I have to do with the tick box exercise almost? Because at some point that's going to really hurt you because you're not going to be able to tell that story, if you like, that very genuine story about you know, what's possible in, in, in terms of the impact you can have and, and, and understanding, if you like, where the growth would be then within that and the different measures that you might need to have. And I think we're, we're kind of skirting around this, this topic of, of metrics and the tyranny of, of metrics and being very careful about every time you have a metric, I always ask, what is it that's not included in this metric that's also really important? Um, and that's a sort of great question to have in mind all the time, when, whether, whether we're looking at school grades, university grades or profit margins or medals, you know, what, what, what else are we missing out here? Yeah, I, th I think one of the things we often see and, you know, I've moved industries and therefore companies quite a few times and I'm often shocked at what I've left behind in one business and see as I join another, certainly as time comes forward. Um, and, you know, 10 years later, I can see some businesses that are still behind businesses that I was at 10 years ago um, and certainly on metrics. So, you know, people who are only just in 2020 embracing um, employee metrics. So talking about, you know, how great it is to work there and, and why do they stick around? So why do I, why do I come to work here? Not just for pay. Um, and you, you typically find that's pretty far down the list. Um, you know, we all work because we need some, need some salary to come in, but why do I stick about? It's normally to do with something to do with the purpose or the people that I work with. I think it'd be really nice, uh, given this sort of chat around purpose and also outcomes, just to hear a little bit from Navia, our student panelist, um, especially going to a university that is obviously one of the, the better ones in the world. So it'd be interesting to hear how comfortable you feel, Navia, moving away from this outcomes focus to a more rounded and holistic approach. Have we got you there? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing your insights so far. It's definitely very interesting to hear, you know, how success can be actually approached in so many different ways. Um, I think when we look to look at different approaches, one thing I definitely always wonder is, you know, as an undergrad and even so many other people at KBS, we all want to leave a long lasting impact. We all want to, you know, have a meaningful contribution in the workplace. So how do we go about setting our goals in such a way that it's holistic, but at the same time, you know, we prioritize and do them really well with quality? Like what would be your one piece of practical advice as we move forward, especially to people who are just starting out? It's a really, it's a really, good, it's a really great question. I think it's one that at the moment you are having a lot of businesses tussle with. Um, so how do I have a meaningful impact? I've, I've been watching at the moment and I love reading about them. If you've uh, read about a British brewer called Brewdog, um, you know, I, I, I read every day and I'm almost in awe that, that these people have, have made decisions to stand up for what they believe in and, and they stick to it. Um, and I think, one of the lessons that you see from those guys is um, making sure you surround yourself with people who believe in you um, and believe in the cause and, and making sure that you don't entertain anyone who doesn't. And I'd say having those people with a, a shared belief that you can make sure that they stick to and believe in your principles, that's where the success of, of that piece comes from. So I, I would say it stems around from, from having that cl clarity of purpose and then people who, who genuinely subscribe to it. 
I think it's an ongoing piece as well. I think you shouldn't sort of feel a pressure to have all the answers because almost I hear that in the question, the sort of what's the answer, tell me. <laughs> um, you know, and actually it's about exploring possible answers because there's probably, there are multiple ones and within your life you'll be able to pursue your purpose in different ways or, or, or maybe pursue more than one purpose as well. So I think there's something about accepting you are, um, you know, on a journey of discovery. Um, and, and then, you know, plotting as you go, if you like, because you know what, you, you really don't know where, where the end point is. So let's not get too fixate, fixated on that. You might have, you might have multiple endpoints in mind. So keep them plural. Um, and, and then think about sort of possible next steps. And I guess always to be thinking about, you know, what, what else can I gain if, if, if actually this isn't exactly where I want to be? Um, and, and we all go through that process. What, what else am I gaining whilst I'm here? I think having that kind of curiosity to, to, to be learning all the time is you know, the, the, one of the really powerful things that will also generate the next step, generate more opportunities. Um, and to think about what are the things I really want to learn about? I, I also see the, the sort of trap sometimes about um, feeling, you know, what I should be doing this. I should be doing something for the environment. I should, you know, I would really counsel against the shoulds yeah. um, and actually going with the things that will get you up in the morning when it's, when you're really exhausted and it's dark and it's, you know, dark outside and it's cold and, and, and you've got some mundane things to do because every job has mundane things to do. What are the things then that will feel worthwhile to you? And to, again, just to take some time to uncover that. Um, but not to get too much trapped into um, feeling I, I, I should be I should be kind of either you know exploring space or saving the environment and anything else isn't worthwhile. No, no, there, there are so many other things that that you can do at a kind of local level, a personal level. So you know, I'd almost pull together that tapestry and be creating that as you go. It's not like I've got a sheet of paper with it on. It's two lines. No, it's a it's a it's a journal. It's a tapestry. It's it's kind of building that. Um, as you go and then thinking oh if I'm here now actually there's some more shoots off that I could take. I, I think um, important to, to say you are going to come up certainly in the, in the business world of a lot of shoulds um, and you can get forced into to those I, I've certainly been guilty of falling into that trap myself many times where you've seen a competitor do it uh, the press have told you you need to do it You've been asked publicly in a you know shareholder meeting that you know this is what you should should or shouldn't be doing or here's what someone else has done, um, and I, I, but I would agree with Kath. I think some of the strongest leaders I've seen are those who stood up to say actually no we're not going to follow, um, we we are setting our own agenda and and here's our why and this is why we're doing it. Um, uh, but but the important bit is you can back it up as to why you are you are or you aren't. Yeah. I think that, that's the critical piece there that you can communicate it really well. So ask loads of whys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I, I, I call it, I've always introduced myself to many people as a, as a petulant two-year-old. Um, and, and, you know, my, my, my kids constantly said why, and, and I'd always encourage it. I love that. Um, and when you get to the point where you can't answer their why, uh, and you find yourself on Google, um, you're also learning and helping for next yeah. It's a good yeah. place to be. It's a great place to be. Totally agree. I think it's really nice nicely with... Um, <laughs> with my own understanding and approach to leadership and, and sort of teaching people about leadership, it's that self-awareness piece of starting to question yourself and your own values before anything else so that you're really sure of which direction you're going in. But just in terms of that, I mean, one of the things we've talked about is just how ingrained this mindset is of winning at all costs. So how, how do you start, apart from building your own self-awareness and understanding what your own purpose is, how do you start to go about changing such an ingrained way of thinking so I think, first of all, we've got to understand where it's come from and where it is around us. We've got to sort of recognise it, notice it, and then the thing, is it helping us? So again, that sort of pursuit of grades, the things that we often take as assumptions, the pursuit of profit, pursuit of medals in sport, we kind of assume that's what it's about. Well, don't, you know, we've got to challenge those assumptions, I guess. So think about what, what are the assumptions I'm making here? What do I think? What, what does society, what do others think success looks like? And then to go, well, what is it for me though? What, what do I want to this? Because quite often we'll see people take a long time to work it out. Um, and the opportunity, you know, for, for, for those listening, for, for Navia, uh, you know, is, is to actually start challenges, challenging these assumptions sooner. So where is it around us? And then actually to be much more proactive about thinking, well, 
you know what, what what is it that that I've seen that that's important to me so we're defining it on our own terms rather than than taking that that assumption um, you know we we notice what we choose to pay attention to so there is something about starting to to kind of uh, observe and I mean I, I having written about it and and been thinking about it for for years you know I see it I walk into a, to a tube station and there's it there it is on an advert trying to get us to win you know they want us to eat their winning takeaway and you know a, again the the films use it the books use it 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 it, it is everywhere and it, when you see it then as a sort of you know, manipulative marketing tool that's trying to get you to buy the next winning hair product, you know, you can start to engage with it and challenge it. Uh, and then you can start to choose to to define things in, in a different way. I think you can always find like minded who who are either doing the same or, or open to it once you suggest it. I think there's something about, you know, again, finding the right organisations that where you can challenge the status quo. So rather than saying, how much am I going to earn? Actually, you know, find out about the culture. We, we observe, this is one of the reasons that companies are shifting is they know this is absolutely key to attracting the best talent and retaining the talent. So culture is, is a really important part of a company and, and not just what they put on the website, not the values they put on the wall. I'm talking the lived culture. So there's a real difference between what's espoused at the top level, what's articulated, what the uh, the website says. But I want to know what actually is the lived experience on a daily basis. And I mean, if you go for interviews and things, if you're really observant, you can generally pick up most of it. You know, it is about even how it feels, kind of finding a car parking space or getting there, or the instructions you're given to get there, or how the receptionist greets you and you know what pictures are on the wall there are, there are so many things that will already tell you whether you really feel at home here um and quickly again whether you know you'll find out whether you can um sort of challenge the status quo you know we even within an interview when you're asking questions of, of the interviewers which which one which is always a good idea so i think um focusing on on culture being aware of the culture around you the culture that you create and that you contribute to um, is a huge area to, to focus on when thinking about where, where am I going and, and where do I want to spend my time, what organisations, what universities, what what companies do, do I want to be engaged with? Yeah, I, 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 so much stuff there that I'm like furiously nodding, trying to stop my head from moving as you're speaking. Um, I, I think there's a, a danger. Um, certainly, I've, I've fallen into the trap that because I've... Uh, got myself up to a position of power in businesses there I can challenge um, and not always anyone in the business can and I think as future leaders of businesses being able to make sure your ears are genuinely open um, and that you've created the right forums and environment for people to be able to talk and for you to genuinely listen um, and respond and make change is is something I just think it's it's critically important um, I'm currently in search for what my next role is going to be. Um, I don't now doubt myself on anything to do with commercial or business or, or running a business. And my pure thing that I am looking for in my next business is the culture. Um, whilst I, I'm comfy in my own skin that I know I can adapt and change cultures to make sure that they're better for, for everyone that's in it as well as the customer. Um, actually, I think starting with something that feels right for me is really important. And, uh, you know, I have been in some situations in the last six months that have made me smile and think I would never come here because it doesn't match what's said or printed on a piece of paper and other places that completely undersell themselves when you get in and you just go, wow, this could be, you know, just a phenomenal place. And actually the, the job there is to tell others about just how, how great they are. So, yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, you've got a unique opportunity there to make sure you join somewhere that's right for you. And the other thing I'd add to that is around growing yourself is making sure that you go to an environment where you believe you can broaden yourself um, and stop the, the, I've always called it a ladder. Um, there's a historical ladder that you need to climb in, in PLC businesses from, you know, entry level to supervisory level, to management level, to middle management level, and then, you know, to exec level. Um, and people want to climb that ladder as quickly as they possibly can. Um, at the ripe old age of 41, I've got nowhere else to go. 
Um, I can go and run slightly bigger turnover businesses and bigger profit businesses. And actually, if I could have my time again, I'd do even more broadening than I did. Um, and actually, I think I was quite fortunate in the amount of broadening that I, ha I have done. So I've taken many side steps into a property role or an HR role or a commercial role to make sure that you have the skills to be the business leader that you want to be at the end. Um, but every time someone offers you an opportunity, if you can, from a personal standpoint, I'd absolutely be grasping those things to make sure you're challenging, you know, what you know and, and how that comes, not just from an ac academic standpoint, but how you apply that into, into the workplace. I think the thing is there to be taking opportunities in all directions. We can feel we only take, we, we need to be looking upwards. And that's yeah. a real mistake, isn't it? If you, if you're actually not, to be thinking broader, you know, again, I, I can remember sort of lots of peers feeling at the time that, oh, this is, this isn't moving me up and therefore it's a bad thing. But actually the, the, the ones who actually often pursued things that just looked really interesting, then they had an incredible combination of skills that then at a leadership when they came to that point of, of uh, a leadership role, A, they were more attractive to be given it, but B, they also brought so much more to that role where you're suddenly looking cross-functionally um, and, and you know, managing large numbers of people and, and very different issues than may have got you first promoted in, in the initial technical kind of roles that you might do. Yeah, I, th I think one of the things that is really looked for in your teams as you, as you progress is credibility. Um, and therefore, if you haven't worked in the marketing function and all of a sudden you're the managing director, managing the marketeers, they want, they want to know how credible you are and how you can challenge their work. Um, so every time you get those opportunities, whether it be for a secondment, whether it be for a short period of time, whether it be doing something voluntarily outside of your workplace of, in something that interests you, you know, those sorts of things, just looking for those opportunities to make yourself grow is really, really important. I think, um, I think Ollie's just given you a fourth C there, credibility. Um, I just wanted to, just to highlight a, a comment that Rhiannon has put into the chat, which I think is really, you know, it's, it gives us cause for optimism. Younger people have so much power to change business because as Kath says, if talented people go to business with the best real culture rather than business mm. that pays the most, businesses will have to change. And I think that's such a key, mm. actually vote with your feet rather than just talking about it. I was wondering to both of you, just thinking about this kind of long wing thinking before we move on to questions from the audience, have you seen examples of where this has been done really well, either by individuals or organizations? Is there? So, no, no, where to start? Um, I, I think, you know, from the, from the world of sport, um, I, which is sort of always my starting point, if you like, and then um, think, thinking more broadly, uh, I think in the world of sport, we are seeing a shift happening where, um, you know, and, and, I mean, not, not happening fast enough, but, but in many cases, the real class performers, the Federers of this world, think in a completely different way than just about winning. You know, they're thinking actually about that kind of, it, pursuing excellence, um, not just about being better than the next person, but actually what's possible and using competitors, you know, welcoming the competition as a means of actually exploring, developing constantly. And I'm always really struck by how, you know, ex externally interviewers, sports journalists sort of say, oh, you must be so fed up to be to be at this time. And there's so many other good people around you. And, and he always being so kind of, you know, incredulous about, you know, I would never be, you know, half the tennis player I am or half the man I am without actually being at this time of incredible people, incredible people around me. So, you know, I see in some of the top levels of sport, the shift to appreciating culture, to appreciating development, you know, the Jurgen Klopp, you know, has, has, has been kind of long focused on development and, you know, really seeing that importance of, of the team and no egos and, and very different kind of kind of style from from your old fashioned football manager. I think when you look at organizations, for me, it's then about those who make purpose really part of who they who they are. So whether that's Timpsons or whether that's Patagonia, so it can happen at, at any levels. But those are sort of two examples that that kind of, you know, are really leading the way. They're not just it's not rhetoric. Um, there's an awful lot of purpose rhetoric and that does a huge amount of damage to this issue. So you can need to discern, um, you know, how is it being lived? It's not that difficult because it's pretty obvious from people who work there, whether it's being lived or not. Um, but, you know, enabling them to to kind of deal with all, all the challenges that come along because they kind of understand why they exist, 
who they exist for and how they want to go about it. And the how is really important in terms of environmental footprint often. Um, you know, and again, that sort of employee experience, you know, just as in universities now, student experience is a really important factor. So you're just churning out people who, who know, who've got knowledge. No, we need to have actually students who've had that opportunity to grow and learn. Um, so this idea of experience, I think, is is uh, increasingly important tool. Yeah, I, I, funny. I, I just I'd written down Timpsons before you said it, and um, you know, if, if those of you who are listening, if you, if you haven't, uh, you know, read up on Timpsons and J James Timpson, who who runs the business, follow him on LinkedIn um, or Twitter, and you know, if you want to see someone who's got a purpose and genuinely lives it and breathes it every day, and what look like small touches, but are absolutely mammoth in terms of mm. the autonomy that is given to his team in individual sites. And the fact that if you're unemployed and go for interview, that they'll dry clean your suit for you. And, you know, if, if there's been a small incident or accident and, you know, the team can fix your key for you without charging you and, and, and small things that make a massive difference to people's lives. And, and listen, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about them now. Um, there's a couple from a, a food standpoint who, who I think do it, but again, they all go back to, I think they've got a strong purpose. Um, and I don't think any of them set out to be big. You know, I don't think Timpson set out to be, you know, over a thousand units, um, but they've grown because people love it and it works. And from a food standpoint, there's a restaurant called Deshoon that's in London and, and they set, set out to, to be serving the best, but with great service and, and quality. And, you know, uh, Shamil, uh, who runs there, it's a phenomenal outfit. Lounges and Cozy Club, which are a business that have really sort of looked at the local environment that they're going into and the local town and every single restaurant or cafe is set up to, to fit in with the local community and the local environment and the clubs they support. Uh, one in London, the Breakfast Club, um, you know, they do different things for different groups of people every day of, every day of the week and support their, their local community. And these have become massively famous in their own right for the, for the small things that they've done that have a huge impact. So I just, I'd say that actually, again, it will go back to the ones that stand the test of time, have the purpose, you know, having run some of the big businesses that are there without the purposes, you know, you're seeing certainly through COVID in 2020, less people looking at the big brands where you're getting um, sheep dipped style service environments and, and the same old, same old. And people are going a little bit more local and looking for somewhere that resonates with them uh, and what they want to get out of life. So I'd, again, I don't think that's going to revert back to how it was. So thinking about that as you come up with purposes, as you enter into businesses will be really important for you. There's a really interesting um, piece of research about the centennials, institutions and organisations that have been around for over 100 years. And they looked at things like the Royal Shakespeare Company and NASA and looked at what was it that characterised these, these organisations. And it was always that they were aiming to be better, not bigger, and that they saw themselves with a role to shape society and to have that impact on the, the world around them, if you like, and to, to move it to a, to a better place. And I thought that's, it was such an interesting um, kind of piece of research quite a while ago now in the Harvard Business Review that, that really sort of gives you that long-term perspective. Brilliant. Let's open it up because we have some questions from the audience. And, and Navia as well, did you have any questions you wanted to ask before we move on to the audience questions? Um, I have a general question. So, you know, um, even me, I really want to embark on this challenging path and, you know, see how it goes. But there's always that fear of failure and, you know, it can always daunt you along the way. So how do we deal with this rejection and keep, uh, you know, getting, up out, getting out of bed every day and still have that energy and excitement, uh, but at the same time face this rejection and stop it from, you know, losing our confidence? I mean, the simple answer, I, I don't want it to sound trite, I hope it doesn't, is, is that it's learning. And uh, failure is, is just a way of exploring something different. So you have a choice to see that as a rejection and to limit it to that, or you have a choice to kind of go, well, what's that telling me? That's telling me that they don't, they don't understand what I can offer, or it's telling me that I don't have the right things to offer for them at the moment. Um, you know, it's about 
kind of it's labeling this fear rejection thing is kind of labeling stuff and then it holds us stuck a little bit where we are I mean you know honestly everything is just an opportunity to learn and and all of the things that are seen most difficult are the things that we learn most from and the quicker we allow ourselves to learn the better you know the quicker we can start thinking well you know what what do I take from this that I can now take into into whatever I want to do next so what you know where might I go who might appreciate my skills what is it they don't see or how might I do do something differently so they can see my skills what's another way if I can't work in this organization what's another way I can still have the impact that organization has because that's never the remit of only one organization so you know again it's about being you know get get back to Ollie's you know um truculent toddler again and and sort of start asking the questions rather than labeling this the sort of the the failure or the rejection where is where is that coming from you, is worth thinking about where, where is that, that that fear of failure coming from who thinks it's a failure um you know I can guarantee you're not going to go through life without it so it's probably better to to kind of accept accept that it, it's actually just useful information yeah I, I'd, I'd say embrace it I've made some massive mistakes in, in my career like, that have cost millions of pounds. Um, uh, and genuinely, anyone who ever starts as a direct report or, or as I've got the, or the next layer down, people that I would meet on their first day of employment, I always say to them, please make as many mistakes as you can. Just don't make them twice. So, so learn from them. And, and, and I think it's really important to give people that, that, that room to go and know, and know that it's safe to come back and tell you when they have. Um, and here's the learnings of what they're going to do differently going forward to, to try and forge a different path. Um, but that's, that's the time, I think, when you're at your greatest learning. So if everything always went swimmingly for you, actually, dare I say, it, it wouldn't be much fun. Yeah, if, yeah. I'm, I'm an operator at heart um, and I love stuff to break because then I can fix it. Um, and that's, you know, I get a perverse amount of pleasure from fixing something that's broken. I love to have a moan about it on the way. You're not going to believe what's happened. Can't believe this has happened today. But actually, that's where you get your most kind of, for me, my most amount of pride comes at the end of when you've solved the problem and then you move on for, for what's next. Mm. So, you know, I, I, I too, not a big fan of, of having words of, you know, rejection or failure or anything like that. It's, we've done something, it was a mistake we didn't want it to end how it's ended so we're going to do something differently about it it's a very uncertain world so there are no right answers so you know it, it can only mean we're just not trying anything in which case we're not going to move anywhere if we're not failing and, and making mistakes so you know again this sort of fear of of not getting the right answer not doing something right it's not a right wrong world I mean you know nobody has had right answers for how to manage a pandemic because it hasn't happened before and, and the future is going to remain uncertain in in many ways be, beyond that um, so actually thinking about yeah how do I handle uncertainty and, and when there isn't a right answer then how can I approach that how can I learn quickly and try something and, and experiment in the best way for me to learn quickly and, and, and adapt and move on. I, I would add to that. The one bad thing that I wouldn't want to see is be paralyzed by, by something going wrong and not making a decision. So I, I'd always rather see a decision be made and, and something go wrong than I would see people stand still, do nothing. Um, because I think you've seen a lot of that throughout this year. I think probably more than, than ever, you've seen some people make decisions and get it wrong. And so long as you can communicate to your teams, customers, any key dependencies, here's why I've made that decision. People will go with you and they'll see why you've got it wrong or why you haven't. You know, some people tried to remain open during lockdown one. It didn't work for them. So they went pivoted and said, we're going to try and do takeout and collection only in, in lockdown two, or we're going to move to a delivery aggregator, whatever it might be that they've then seen someone else do well and jumped on it. But those who've just said, this is terrible, everyone goes on furlough, I'm going to take uh, as much, you know, C-bills loans as I possibly can and sit still until everyone's open again. You know, they thought that that would be three months ago. They thought it was going to be last week. Um, they're now hoping it might be the 16th. It, it won't. Right. So, you know, this is going to go on till March. So making sure that you've made some decision that's for the best for you and your business is really, really important. Don't, don't sit still. I think that sort of picks up on Michelle's question that, that, that came in on the Q&A as well about reframing the feeling you've been thrown off course. You know, that, the, 
how interesting if you're thrown off course great I, that's when I want to get really curious what is it that's thrown you off what is it that you hadn't foreseen or that was you know that, that came out of the blue that that's just a place of being thrown off course is that place of learning off course is where the learning happens not yep. on the course moving sweet yes. plain sailing or whatever the metaphors are that I'm mixing you also think there's um, some kind of nice learning here as well from a leadership perspective because you know you're both talking about being able to freely make mistakes and learn from those but I do think there is a role for, for a leader in terms of psychological safety to embrace that as mm. you said Ollie yes make mistakes but don't make it you know too many times so making the space as a leader is really important in that as well. Yeah, I've been really privileged um, to be able to afford that space to, to people um, in, in more senior leadership positions. Uh, and I will say that wasn't always afforded to me in, in other roles I've had historically. Um, as, I, as I've grown through different businesses, some amazing, you know, Yum, I'd hold up as a shining example globally uh, as a business that, that really listens and wants people to take people who will challenge the status quo um, and therefore broaden themselves and the business and, and grow together. Yet other businesses really didn't want that and actually would use terms such as, you know, that's a failure. And people would exit businesses like that pretty quickly because of that. So, you know, that goes back to picking the right business on culture uh, and really make sure you ask the right questions as you go through interview processes um, about the leadership and the leadership style and speaking to people who would be your peers potentially as you join so you understand really what it's it's like to be in a, a given workplace i'd like to just quickly get in peter's question before we um <laughs> before we start to wrap up and i think it's a really important one because he says you know when we use a sort of a certain metric of success part of the issue is is that we always shift our goals so success is always moving and there's some really nice work it's, it's something called the happiness advantage that sean Aker's done which looks at this mm. saying we've got things the wrong way around instead of chasing success we should be working on well-being and happiness and then the success will follow but what do you two think can we ever truly be successful or do we just always move the goalposts Kath? Yeah, I mean, that's really what long thinking is trying to do it, 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 in a similar way is sort of get us away from outcomes and more about the, the kind of infinite journey of, of learning and developing uh, and how we bring ourselves to that. And that's as important as any outcome that may or may not happen along the way. Um, and, and sort of stretching the, you know, broadening the criteria, stretching the time frame, kind of gives us more, more space, if you like, to explore then just, just what's possible for ourselves to reach our potentials in, in different ways. Um, so I guess I'm coming at, at a very similar um, approach, really, to, to, to Sean Akers um, in the long way. And I think anything that's an accumulation, I mean, that whole, you know, the language there that, you know, that, that's used is really vivid, isn't it? You know, yet, of course, once we're into that more, 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 it's never enough and we get diminishing returns. So, yeah, if you're ever in that more, more, more trap and you're thinking, what's next? What's next? You actually know that, that you know, things don't have that much meaning. We're, we're in the gambler's part of our mind that's responding to, oh, I need another this. I need another medal. I need another goal. Um, and that brings diminishing returns because it doesn't last. It's temporary. This is the, the challenge in sport is you win a medal, it lasts for a minute, you cross the line. And then what happens? And we have so many athletes who feel depressed. We have sort of you know, literally 50 percent of Olympic athletes with mental health issues, emotional issues, because they haven't got a meaning that lasts beyond when you cross the line and get the medal. You stand on the podium, then what? If that moment doesn't have meaning for what comes thereafter and connect with what's gone before, then you know it's a very empty process and you what you chase the next one you chase the next one and we've heard sort of johnny wilkinson talking about how he chased caps and titles and trophies for the, waiting for the joy to come and it never did so that is just yeah that that is just not a helpful path so redefining redefining for yourself is where is is where we need to go yeah, I, I think it's helpful to have to to really think about what does success look like for you. And if you were to, you know, phone my old executive team at Frankie and Benny's, they would say some strange things, but but uh, they're important to share. You know, so the number one thing they would all know was the most important thing to me would be could I be home for seven p.m. in the evening? Because if I could, I wanted to read a book to both my children and put them in the bath. And, and it, it sounds so strange, but it was so important to me. And actually that bit of my day gave me more joy than anything else could do at work. Now, at some point, they're not going to want dad to bath them anymore uh, or read them a story. So I'm going to have to come up, come up with something else that's, you know, what's my key piece. But thinking about to come away from that more, 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 
you can easily, I see so many people fall in that trap. Uh, and genuinely, certainly in a, a FTSE 250, FTSE 100 PLC world, it becomes, can I dine in the best restaurants? Who's got the best car? Who's got the biggest house? Blah, blah, blah. And, and genuinely, once you get there, it means nothing, you know? So, so thinking, uh, and, and you go to the, exactly what Kath described from the kind of sport and, and athlete piece. It, it's, you know, what actually gives you satisfaction um, they're the things that you, that's what success is. And you want to make sure you, you find those things that, that keep you happy from a, from a wellbeing standpoint. I think that's a really positive note to end on. So um, I'm conscious of the time. So I'd just like to close today's webinar and thank everybody that's taken part today. Kath, thank you so much. Ollie, thank you. And Navia, okay. thank you so much for giving your time today. I hope you all found this uh, webinar interesting. Um, and thank you for your, your questions as well. Take care.